Hi everyone, can you hear me? Good. So today I'm going to talk about uh, Management 101, which is a compilation of my experiences and all the learning I had so far into engineering management. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about the hiccup. <laughs> so, a uh, short introduction about me. I have about uh, 15 years in uh, software engineering, some more, five at least, uh, in management. I'm currently managing a distributed team at SUSE. And by distributed, I mean that uh, we have seven different locations, including Australia, which is sometimes challenging in uh, terms of time zone. So I'm a remote manager of a remote team, although today I'm not going to talk specifically about remote although it's an important part of what I do. So the first thing I want to tell you is uh, some companies look as management as a promotion, as something that is the only way to progress in your career. And I think that is fundamentally wrong. Management is a career change, is something completely different. And even if you have a lot of years as a software engineer, if you move to management, you are going to start from scratch. You are going to be a beginner again. So you'll stop being judged by your technical knowledge and you'll be on the spotlight in how you interact with people, how do you put people together to work on something bigger. And the first step towards this is knowing yourself and knowing how sometimes you are affected by your own ways of thinking, how you are biased and how you make bad decisions based on that. So, Knowing yourself is essential to be a good manager. I would say it's essential for being a good anything. <laughs> and it's really easy to be tricked by your own mind. So one of the common things is that you remember things selectively. You tend to look for information that only reinforces what you already know instead of looking for disconfirming evidence. And this effect tends to be stronger if you are emotionally attached to something. If it's a topic that is very dear to you or that you learn through a lot of hardship, you'll tend to have a lot of difficulty in letting it go. Some of the common biases that affect all of us I would say that this first one is quite common. When you like something, you tend to pay more attention to that, and the opposite happens when you don't like it. Even if it's something that is correct, if you don't like that idea, you'll probably dismiss it in the first sight instead of trying to understand why it happens. So it's something we need to fight against. The second one is also very common, I would say. All of them are. Uh, and it's about judging people based on their actions without considering the environment and the conditions that led to a certain outcome. So we tend to say, oh, this person did this. Uh, it's because of his or her personality. And sometimes, if not many times, that might be strongly conditioned by the environment, by something that happened that caused that person to act in that way. It's important to keep in mind and not judge people based on a specific situation, on a specific outcome. Reciprocation, so we tend to sometimes do decisions or do actions based on how other people treat us, even if we are doing the wrong thing. And this is quite uh, common, for example, in sales processes. You might be familiar with situations where salespeople offer a small gift in exchange for closing a deal. And this really has a strong effect. It's more powerful than, than you want to imagine. And this is quite connected with the social proof tendency, actually, which is the tendency to act according to what a certain group is doing. If you are in a room and all of your colleagues have a certain opinion, you'll most likely be biased or you'll have a tendency to not go against that because of social proof, because you don't want to feel different, you don't want to sound wrong. Maybe you are not completely sure about your perspective and if everyone else is doing something different, maybe they are right. And then there is the over-influence by contrast. So, we tend to see things based on their contrast, on how different they are from what we are used to. And this influences our decision because we see things that have a bigger contrast as being more important. And that, not, that is not always the case. So, a uh, quote from Richard Feynman, it's very easy to fool yourself, so try to keep those things in mind uh, when dealing with other people that sometimes you might be biased and you might be doing things not considering the reality, but uh, your own perception of it. 
Second thing, the power of incentives. So this is a very powerful driving force in everything we do. And it has to do in what, what we, are you regarding or what are you rewarding uh, with, uh, with your people? What is more relevant? Is it the salary? Is it delivering something? Is it the team spirit? So all those things have a strong influence, not only on what you get from your team, but also the culture that you create. Incentives create culture, and culture also creates incentives. So it's kind of a loop that uh, is very strong and is uh, something that needs to be very carefully planned. And when you try to create a culture, uh, you should be paying a lot of attention to what kind of incentives you have in place and how they can shape that culture. And also the role of intuition. So many times we think, oh, uh, this is something I know how to do. I don't know exactly how I have learned it, why I know it, but I have this sequence of steps in my mind that I know that will fix the problem. This is great for playing chess, and all great chess masters rely on this for making quick decisions. However, it does not work when dealing with people, when doing software engineering, when doing complex tasks in an environment that is constantly changing. So it's nice to have some intuition, but you have to know when to use it and when it might be fooling you. So you should always try to think from first principles. If you don't know why something has happened, try to ask why, and then why again, and get to the root causes so that in the end you are able to see the world as it is and make decisions based on that. As a manager, uh, you also will need to create a good environment, and environment, culture, all those things mean about the same, I would say. And I will, I will read this quote from a, a study that was done by Google about uh, the quest to build the perfect theme. I think it's one of the most relevant quotes on that study. On the good themes, members spoke in roughly the same proportion, and it's a phenomenon that the researchers refer to as equality in distribution of, of conversational turn-taking, which means that people have the psychological safety to talk about things, to discuss their ideas, to present their perspectives, and this makes a lot of difference when it comes to collaboration, when it comes to people working together on something bigger. What is this thing, culture? You know, it's, it's really hard to define, actually, because it's something very specific to each group of people. There is not a global definition of culture. If we take these people here, we have a certain culture. If we take a subset of these people, maybe we'll have a different culture. If we have this event on some other time, only with a part of people uh, that are here, we'll also have a different culture, probably. So it depends a lot on who is there and how people feel what is happening at the moment. It's hard to create a good culture. It's also super powerful. So when, uh, when it happens, it can make a big difference in terms of success. And one thing that I believe that defines a good culture is this high average social sensitivity which mainly means being nice to each other. You know, if you are nice to each other, you'll tend to have a good culture in your team. Team dynamics, so high energy and low pressure, what is this supposed to mean? Is that you need the right level of challenge. You can't be without any pressure, otherwise it will get boring. However, it has to be the sort of energy that creates enthusiasm and not pressure. So you have a big challenge ahead, but you have a flexible deadline. You have an objective which is deliver the best thing and not deliver on date X. This sort of thing creates that environment that helps a lot in motivating people. Organizational awareness. So you need to know what is going on, especially on a large company. If you don't know what your business is doing and you are just doing development tasks, it tends to be harder to understand the big picture to know what you are fighting for, what are you going to build in the end. And for this, it's really important to have retrospectives to discuss how different people view what is going on. What are you feeling about it? Can you improve something? Maybe it looks good from the outside, but it's not having a good effect on the team. And last but not least, when there is something good, celebrate it. Celebrate it often and celebrate it in an explosive way sometimes. It's really, really important. And I have to highlight this uh, in uh, the case of distributed themes that don't see each other every day. So celebrating there gets even more important. 
Now, what is the role of engineering managers in all this? So not all companies have this role. Uh, many, many of them do actually. And what is an engineering manager supposed to do in the first place? So crafting the environment. It's not just about putting people together, but also making sure that those people are able to deal with each other, that they have the psychological safety to work in collaboration without being afraid of saying something different, of having an opinion. Also balancing forces. Uh, we have, uh, in most organizations, different stakeholders. We have project managers, we have product people, we have business people, and sometimes we have conflicting arguments, requirements, and it's the role of the engineering manager to protect the team and to make sure that we are not only fulfilling the business needs, but that the, that the team is doing that in a way that feels comfortable, that feels safe. Creating learning opportunities, it's uh, super important, not only because you want people to grow, and I'll get to that later, but also uh, because uh, those learning opportunities will ultimately make the business better. It will bring more ideas, it will help the company succeed. And connecting the dots. So uh, managers do have visibility about what is going on on the company at a different level, on other teams. So making sure that all that information is put together and relate to the team in the proper form is also a very important thing to do. Then developing people. And here we get to coaching and mentoring. So those are two different things and equally important. Coaching is about doing something on a specific task better. So teaching someone how to write an epic story, teaching someone how to solve a specific problem around a certain language or a certain framework. This is coaching. Uh, and mentoring is a different thing. It's long term. It's, for example, learning or uh, teaching someone how to become a manager. This is long term work. This requires some planning. It requires that people understand each other, that there is some idea that will take months to implement sometimes, and that it gets executed in a structured way. And also, managers are supposed to drive performance. I don't mean performance in terms of evaluating people, although that's also a required part on some organizations, but in terms of making sure everyone is doing their best. And for that purpose, objectives have to be quite clear and inspirational. And one example that I have here is that we want to become this product or this company in this market in this time frame, something that makes people feel, oh, I, I'm aiming for something big. But then you have to make sure that this is uh, broken down into something that is measurable, which we call the key results in the OKR framework. So, how are we going to know if we have achieved our objective? How can we tell? And in all this, time frame is quite meaningful for both the company and the people so that you feel that you have achieved your objective. It's, it can't be something that goes on forever. It has to be time bound and it has to go through by these characteristics in order to make it appealing. And uh, last but not least, again, inspiring people. This is actually one of the most important things that a manager should do. Encouraging new experiences. Make sure that people are able to try things outside their area of expertise. That they are able to even try things that are completely outside their role just because they want to learn something new. Obviously, companies also need to collaborate a bit on this to, to make it possible. And the end result has to look appealing. Sometimes uh, looking at just some a bunch of problems to fix is not interesting. But if people understand why those problems are being fixed, what will be the outcome, what will be happening of interesting in the end, it becomes a lot easier to become motivated. And the path of fulfilling growth. Uh, this is typically easier on large organizations when you are able to see many more things around you. So it's the role of a manager to make sure that you are able to grow, that all the opportunities that happen inside an organization are visible to you, and that you have the right coaching, the right mentoring to pursue your interests, your interests and your passions. So what are the rituals that are important for a manager to have? First and most importantly, Keep learning. You are forever a student. And you have to read a lot about technical things, non-technical things. 
You have to understand what is going on. You have to understand how other people are, are doing their job. So you have to have some inspiration, some examples. You have to test those ideas as well. And again, this uh, requires that your organization collaborates with you to do some experimental stuff. Because if you just read about some new idea and you do not have the opportunity to try it, well, what, what will that knowledge be worth? So you need to actually practice things. It will fail sometimes, no problem. That's part of it. Keeping fit on engineering topics. Uh, for any engineering manager, this is a strong recommendation. Some organizations want that engineering managers focus uh, on people management. And even when that is the primary focus, my opinion is that uh, we should keep fit on engineering topics. We should know what our people are doing, not only because that is inspiring for people, but because that allows us to give good guidance and to help the team grow. If we don't know what is going on on the product, if we don't know te about technology, then it will be much harder to make it work. And adapting. So things are constantly changing. What is true tomorrow by, might not be so. Uh, what is true today might not be so tomorrow. And you don't want to stick to the old habits. If you look at something that should be seen from a different angle, adapt, adjust, let your previous visions go. So practicing in, uh, management like a developer practices engineering is what I would recommend here. So. Always keep practicing, keep learning, never let it go. Some more specific things like the manager versus maker, maker schedule. In uh, many organizations, you'll need to deal not only with people topics, but also uh, with some project topics. You'll need to put the pieces together. Sometimes, if you have the chance, you'll also write some codes. And you need to put all this in a schedule, right? Because we only have 24 hours in a day. Hopefully, we'll want to be working only eight. So having your schedule organized in a way that you pack your meetings together so that your focus on talking with people is always during the same time frame and you have some dedicated time where you are not interrupted, you are able to spend some time learning, spend some time doing things that require a lot of focus without interruption is very important. And it's uh, many times required for a manager to do context switching. It's impossible to avoid. But when doing that, always make sure that you have a primary focus. So this week, I'm working on evaluations. This is my primary goal. I'll be doing other things. I'll get interrupted, but I can only have a primary focus. If I'm doing that, plus thinking of how a new shiny feature will look like, and those are two highly competing priorities, one of them will suffer, or probably both, and things won't get done. It's OK to have competing priorities, but make sure there is only one primary. One-on-one -on -one meetings, very important part, because that's where you get insights about what is going on with your people. This is not a status report. It's not supposed that you are asking, hey, uh, so how is your task going? Uh, can we do some pair programming? Oh, I'm having some problem here. I'm stuck. No, this is not the purpose. Those can be done separately. One-on-one -on -one meetings are to be used for personal interaction, for mentoring, for getting to know who is on the other side. They must have a personal touch. <coughs> it can't be something like impersonal or just talking about the product, about the business. People have to feel close. And you have to create trust. If you are not creating trust with your people during your one-on-one -on -one meetings, this is not working. Almost done. <laughs> yeah. Taking notes. So uh, this, at least for me, it's a very important part, not only to keep track of the conversations you have, especially when you have a lot of reports. It's hard to keep everything in your mind, all the details. So write a lot of notes. Write summaries of what you read whenever you are reading a book, an article. Write your perception, your interpretation about what you just read. That will help you to recall information later. A decision journal is also important, at least on all the major decisions. Uh, you have to make a decision. You write down what is the context, what are the driving forces, what you will make the decision, and what is the expected outcome. Yeah, sometimes it will go wrong. But over time, this will be a powerful tool. And uh, you have to do this in your own framework. So the way I use um, to structure my notes might not work for you, might be a completely different thing depends on how we think, how we structure information in our minds. Your notes should be a reflection of that. 
I think this says it also, it's not about uh, transporting information, it's about transporting a mindset. So you feel something about a situation today, if you read your notes in a week, you should be able to get to that mindset. It's hard, but if you can structure your information the right way, it will be a very powerful tool. Where do managers can get stuck? The first common one uh, is micromanagement, especially from people that uh, come from a development background. We tend to, and this happened with me as well, we tend to uh, initially look a lot into what is happening, into the details, and to unblock people by actually going there and writing some code sometimes. This should be avoided because it uh, shifts your focus away from the big picture and you tend to lose uh, your attention on other important things. Saying no, super important and super hard, <laughs> but you have to, to say no and sometimes you have to say no to your superiors, you have to say no to the stakeholders. Uh, people will get mad at you, uh, but this is needed uh, because otherwise things will break. And the last one is not building strong peer relationships. Other fellow team leads, other fellow managers are people that you want to keep a strong interaction with so you can learn from each other. Last thing, listen. And this is really hard. It's not just transcri uh, transcribing what someone is saying, not just writing notes, it's actually understanding who is on the other side, what is happening, what are they concern or their concerns, how can you help. So active listening means a lot of focus. You have to be with your mind totally concentrated on that conversation that you are having with someone so that you can take the whole set of information and actually extract some meaning from what is happening. And this is what I have for you today. No time for questions, I think. So thank you all. <laughs>